Welcome everyone, bienvenidos to this um, session of the Mexican Studies Seminar at the University of Chicago. Um, as you know, we're devoting this quarter to the topic of uh, insecurity, violence, and criminal organizations. My name is Emilio Curi, I'm the CAT Center's director, and today we are very pleased to have as our speaker, Janice Gallagher. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Rutgers University in Newark. She received her PhD in government at Cornell and uh, recently published a book entitled uh, Bootstrap Justice, The Search for Mexico's Disappeared, which will be the topic of today's presentation um, entitled indeed, The Search for Mexico's Disappeared. Um, as you know, after her presentation is finished, we'll have time uh, for a Q and A session. Um, again, thank you for joining us. and. Uh, um, we extend our warmest welcome to Janice Gallagher. Janice, thank you. Thank you so much. Hold on one second. I'm just trying to flip the PowerPoint. Let's see. One second. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been um, really impressed by the other, I've attended a couple of the other seminars and I'm really um, uh, happy to be among you and, um, and really honored to participate. So thank you again for the, um, for the opportunity to be here today. I should say just by way of explanation, um, I, there, I'm in my, I'm, um, I'm on sabbatical and I'm on my way to Mexico. Right now I'm sitting in a uh, hotel room in New York City um, awaiting my flight um, uh, tomorrow with my dog um, in the background. So that is why I have a napping um, dog in the background, Uva, who is uh, um, from Mexico and I'm taking her with me there. So anyway, I hope she's, she remains uh, um, compliant throughout this. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me get right to it. Um, so, I published um, Bootstrap Justice, The Search for Mexico's Disappeared in, um, in 2022. And, and we were, I was just talking um, uh, with Professor Cordy about, um, about the fact that this was a book that was a result of a lot um, a lot of field work about, I've worked on this book for more than 10 years. I started field work in 2010 for this. Um, and I had, I kept waiting for there to be kind of a turning point and inflection point um, where I would be able to say something, this is very kind of very, very, maybe very American, but um, where there would be kind of a clear um, break, um, a decrease in the disappearances, kind of a, a reason for hope um, at the kind of at the, at the macro level. Um, and there never was. Right, so I think in terms of um, I'll talk kind of in depth about this today, but um, in terms of how I decided to write this book and why this book is largely centered on um, the individuals who were struggling against impunity, um, for me the real the story um, where we're seeing variation, where we're seeing kind of hope, where, and where we're seeing I think actual actual change, we really have to drill down into the colectivos, into the individuals um, who are whose loved ones have been disappeared. They're the ones who've been kind of leading the struggle and I think um, really making a difference. If we can say that we have seen any change in any kind of forward progress in terms of um, <clears throat> eroding impunity, I think it lies with the with the with the colectivos de victimas with the people who've been mobilizing. So that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so just kind of overview, um, I'll talk about I'll talk about the book, um, the framing and the argument, um, I'm going to concentrate again on legal consciousness, which is essentially making the argument that the way people think about the state and justice matters um, for what they're able to accomplish and it matters for how we think about um, where change might come from in terms of impunity in Mexico. I'll talk briefly about um, kind of the other half of the argument of the book. I'll, I'll gloss over it and I'm happy to talk more about it um, in Q&A, um, which is recognizing political and legal opportunities. I'll talk briefly about the actual accomplishments um, um, that I think the victims movement has made um, and, then, and then conclude. Um, so as I said uh, before, I, I started working on um, 
on uh, disappearances in Mexico um, in 2010, right? It was just when um, it was kind of becoming discussed, well, just when we were starting to recognize that there was a crisis of disappearance. The first, my first research ship, the Movimiento por la Paz, had not um, hadn't emerged. Um, and then obviously by the spring of 2011, um, they had, which kind of blew up my research design um, in a good way. And I spent um, a lot of time um, with the Movimiento por la Paz um, between 2011 and 2013, kind of meeting most of the people that appear in the book um, and um, with the Movimiento por la Paz kind of uh, and the caravans they did um, going in different parts of the country. Um, I worked in 18 of, of 32 states um, uh, interviewing people who had who had been involved in these struggles. Um, so kind of your big picture, when I started the book, disappearances obviously were, um, were beginning to be um, a nationwide crisis, and that has only, as we all know, um, gotten worse. And also, this is, and this is kind of uh, intentionally an old slide, the other thing that kind of big picture was true was that we knew that impunity in Mexico was rampant um, after many hours. Um, and uh, hundreds of, of information requests. Um, I'm confident that the numbers uh, in terms of what we know really about the judicial status of cases of disappearances, um, we really know very little because of the way cases are classified um, and reported, but kind of, I think it's suffice. So the figure I currently use is that impunity approaches um, 100% uh, in these cases and, and kind of a in, the, in 2015, kind of officially, uh, Mexico was ranked second in the world in terms of impunity. So kind of given that backdrop of a growing crisis of disappearances in a state that um, uh, admittedly does very little to address that, my research question for the book is, how do people in context of normalized rights violations transform into rights claiming and ultimately rights bearing citizens? So again, this is something I've been working on for more than 10 years. 250 interviews. I did participant observation with, um, uh, when I tally them up, more than 99 different organizations. Um, lots of information requests. I did a, I did a original survey. And really what I'll focus on today and what makes up a lot of the book is life history interviews. Um, so kind of very briefly, um, the argument I make um, in the book is that through the process of continually making claims on the state and engaging in mobilization, first, people's understandings of the law legality and the state shift. And that with these shifts, their ability to challenge the inner workings of impunity are likewise transformed. So for those of you who are more visual, which I am, I think in some ways this, this argument is, is unsurprising, right? What we know, we know from a lot of different literatures that when people mobilize, when people come together, they're going to make some progress in terms of um, promoting justice and eroding impunity. We know this from transnational advocacy networks, from legal mobilization, um, so from a bunch of a, a bunch of different literatures, people together um, struggling for justice will make some inroads. We also know that when people continually, individuals continually make claims on the state, um, they also might achieve some victories. We know that they might change the information that goes into the case files. We know that they, um, Ronaco Michel tells us that when we have private prosecutors, when um, that is when citizens are allowed to legally occupy um, uh, legally participate in the prosecution of these cases. We also um, uh, will, will improve outcomes in some ways. And we know from Gonzalez Ocantos um, that when civilians are able to transmit a more cosmopolitan vision of the of law to judges, um, that is, so when civilians change the way judges think, um, uh, we will have some erosion of impunity. So I kind of turn what Gonzalez Ocantos says on his head. Um, and I argue that when we change the way that the claimants, the victims think, that is the the that is one key to understanding how the erosion of impunity happens. Um, and so I think what again, what I'm really focusing on and what I think is under under understood and when I thought about what I wanted to say in this book, I really want to go inside this sustained mobilization box, the way that individuals themselves and um, individuals as they participate in social movements, how that whole universe of actions, first of all, that those aren't distinct, right? So we we have literature that talks about individuals and, and, and literature that talks about social movements. We don't have very much work that um, talks about the intersection, right? That talks about both um, uh, of course, movements are made up, made up of people, but we often lose that level of disaggregation and kind of presume that collectives act as collective. So I'm really trying to unpack what's happening 
in that process of a person, and especially in the Mexican context, where we know that the majority of victims who participate in mobilization were not previously um, politicized in any way. And I'll, and um, I would say for this reason, I think about Ayotzinapa in a really different way, and I'm happy to talk about that. For the, the vast majority of victims who organize um, in the wake of the disappearance of their loved one, this is their first rush with politics, first time mobilizing. So how do they go from people who were kind of living their daily lives into people who are um, participating in social movements, um, kind of often meeting with presidents and um, becoming involved in legislative processes? What's happening um, in that transformation? Um, and what does that teach us about the nature of their actions and what they're capable of? Um, so today I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus on this transformation of legal consciousness and linking it to the erosion of impunity. Excuse me. So in the book, I focus on three families who are from really different walks of life from different parts of the country whose um, loved ones disappeared in very different circumstances. Um, so it's a kind of implicitly, this is the most different comparison. What they converge on um, as I'll talk about is they end up acting and thinking in really similar ways. The one thing that they had in common before um, the disappearance of their loved ones is a shared lack of voice. So let me introduce these three, these three families. Um, first of all, um, the disappearance of Alejandro Alfonso Moreno, um, who was disappeared January 27th, 2011. So Alejandro was from a wealthy family. Um, his mother, Lucia, uh, was a homemaker. Um, she described her life as a Disneyland um, before this happened. Um, Alejandro was an engineer. He was disappeared on his way to the United States. Um, he was going to pick up a computer in Texas. He didn't want to fly because he was scared the computer would get um, jostled on the plane. Um, so he decided to drive to pick up the computer um, and bring it home. So he was, and he was disappeared on the highway between uh, Nuevo León and Tamaulipas. Um, so his family, obviously, um, from means, but his um, his mother talks. His mother Lucia um, describes kind of her feeling of um, of her feeling before and after the disappearance. She says, "What am I proud of or surprised by? Before I couldn't speak." The pain, I just couldn't. But you know what? These miserable people, they thought we were like crystal, but we have been forged like iron after being beat down so many times. The next case, um, maybe many of you have heard of, um, these are the four sons of Doña Maria Herrera. Um, in the book, I focus mainly on Juan Carlos. These are four brothers who were disappeared two years apart. Um, these are, uh, this is a family um, of merchants who were doing door-to-door -door, um, buying and selling of gold and melting it down. All of the brothers were disappeared kind of in the course of that work. Um, and kind of their brother Juan Carlos um, talks about um, his life both kind of before and, and after the disappearance as, as always kind of understanding that the law was something that he could manipulate. He had um, migrated to the US, been deported, kind of understood um, and several times. So he understood kind of how to play with legality. Um, but nevertheless, despite that, he talks about um, uh, kind of what it was like for him for the, the first time that he um, joined with social movements. He says, at first I didn't understand what agendas were, nor what even do they mean by dynamics, systematize the evidence, all worlds that I completely didn't understand. I didn't go to high school. For me, it was triple the work to understand everything. So at first I felt like an idiot, but little by little I figured out what they were talking about. Seeing the different messaging, I dared to start talking a little more. Finally, um, Nancy Rosete, um, and um, whose only son, Elvis Axel Torres Rosete, was disappeared on December 27th, 2009. Um, Elvis was disappeared from a drug treatment center. Um, he had been smoking marijuana, sniffing glue, and he was 18 years old. His mom was concerned about him falling into addiction. She had sent him to a um, drug treatment center. She was she was a poor single mother. She had supported herself um, uh, by selling cactus in the market. Um, so sending her son to drug treatment center, she felt was the, the kindest thing she could do for him. The, and the treatment center, which the treatment center's name, which gets me every time, was called Salva Tu Vida. Um, save your life, right? So she thought she was doing him uh, a huge favor and he was disappeared from that place. Um, Nancy describes um, uh, oops, um, arriving to the movement for peace. She says, when I arrived, 
I couldn't speak. I only knew how to cry. But when I started going back and forth to the movement for peace, I tell you that I learned to know myself because I saw that I could, I had that potential. That is, I realized that I could speak. I realized all that I could do. So kind of in terms of how I tell these stories and how I understand them, I use um, the legal consciousness framework from Uric and Sylvie 1998, which posits that um, there's kind of three archetypes of how people think about the law. Often wealthy people, but not, not necessarily, think about themselves as before the law. That is, they think about the law as something kind of majestic, um, beyond reproach, and something that justly orders the world. Um, so that's the first archetype, and I argue that that's how Lucia and Alfonso, the, the parents of Alejandro Alfonso Moreno Aca, that's how they thought about the law prior to the disappearance. Um, Next, uh, with the law, that's the perspective that I argue Juan Carlos had. People who see themselves as with the law don't assign any clear um, value to the law. The law is a game to be played and a game to be won, right? So it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's not something to be, it's not against you, it's not with you. It's a set of rules that you um, play with. It's a disaggregated, they don't, people who think about themselves as with the law think about the state as a disaggregated set of actors with dis with distinct incentives. Um, and again, I, I argue that Juan Carlos um, kind of embodies that, that, um, that frame of mind. And finally, um, against the law. These are people who grew up thinking um, that the law, or not necessarily grew up, but thinking about the law as aligned against them and therefore either something to avoid or something to resist. Um, I'm going to go into kind of the overall argument is that trauma changes the way people think about themselves before the law. That no matter where people think about, um, no matter what people's legal consciousness was before, and again, before kind of the, the overall understanding of legal consciousness is that it's fairly static, but the argument of the book is that that um, trauma and specifically the type of trauma um, that families experience after the disappearance of their loved one um, materially shifts the way that they think about themselves um, and the state and therefore changes the way that they act, right? So that's kind of, that's the, the overall argument. What I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go into some detail about what does that look like um, for Nancy? So again, um, Nancy is, was a single mom. She was raised, her father was a policeman um, and kind of from a very young age, uh, he was violent with the family. The family would try to flee um, and given her dad's um, uh, contact with the police wherever they wherever they went he would track them down so this is from Uick, Uick and Sylvie they describe people as who think of themselves as against the law as people describe legality as the net in which they are trapped and within which they struggle for freedom for so for Nancy that was literally true right wherever they went the law in the form of her father would um, follow them and continue to um, uh, perpetrate violence against her and the rest of the family um, and again, we might think about being against the law as fighting against it, but for her, it's more, um, uh, it was more avoidance. So again, from Ewick and Sylvie, a resistant understanding of legality is expressed in silences, refusals, and absences, as well as in acts of defiance and disruption. So Nancy describes herself as initially um, timid, as a woman who didn't have a voice, as somebody who didn't have agency in her in her in her life. So, what are, what are the types of changes that she describes um, during the course of mobilization? She says. Um, so, this is recounting um, kind of early days of her mobilization. She says, for almost all of 2014, I soaked myself in learning. I now know more or less how to gather evidence, how to properly make a formal report, what tools are needed to search for someone and to investigate. Always have a notebook and a pen write down everything you do and everyone you meet with and what time, date, what agreements there are. I have learned to get everything in writing since words are blown away by the wind. So we see her as going from alienated, avoiding, um, kind of avoiding engagement to um, being savvy about what it looks like. Um, again, this is somebody who um, I, tell, I talk in the book about um, when terrible things happened to her, including um, she was raped, she talks about, she never thought about reporting it, right? So she kind of, no matter what would happen, um, she wouldn't go to the police. She talks about um, when her son was disappeared, it took her two weeks to actually report it to the police because she was so convinced that they would not help, they would make things worse. So that's where she was before the disappearance. And now she talks about um, her relationship with, with um her ally in the attorney general's office. So she says she 
has taught us about so many legal things, or how do you say policies? What is law? What is the Senate, the Chamber of Deputies? What benefits us? What will hurt us? And it's not that she's our informant, but she teaches us. We have had our eyes closed. And then we ask her, what does all this mean? What does that mean? What about this law? And she says, okay, come in. And she explains the law this and the law that, right? So we see her kind of um, going towards state actors rather than avoiding them. And finally, um, I thought one really interesting thing. So Nancy um, is part of leading a hunger strike outside of the, um, the at the time, the PGR, and, and I believe it's 2013, which leads to, um, is one of the kind of, significant precursors to the victim's unit being uh, created inside of the Procuraduría. And she says, so through that meeting, she's she gets an introduction to the governor of the state of Mexico. Um, and I think importantly, she doesn't say, finally, the state is accepting us. Before she was ever involved in the movement, she had tried to go to the governor, get uh, meetings, and they always kind of um, avoided her, um, uh, treated her badly, essentially. So it's not that she got these meetings and now um, she's painting it in a rosy picture. So here's her um, describing uh, the meetings of the state officials. They started feeding feeding us atole con el dedo, which for this audience, you probably know what that means, right? So um, uh, giving us just a little bit, right? They dressed it all up. They said, have a seed, what can I get you? And they tried to make it all look pretty. They wrote things down, they did things, they asked questions, but it came to show results, there was nothing, right? So she goes, not only is she um, kind of, uh, in engaging with the state, but she's showing a level of political sophistication in terms of what is what is really going on. Um, so why does this matter, right? Kind of why do we? Why does it? Why why look really closely at the transformation of individuals um, in these uh, in these in these struggles? So Nancy goes from again being somebody without who's with no political experience, who sees herself as without agency, to founding a victims collective. She's the case coordinator, and she keeps the 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 case notes of the uh, 20 or so other families that are that go with her to the to the state prosecutor's office um, in a file and is essentially the case coordinator. She, again, she helps to lead a hunger strike. She and she also um, this really surprised me. She participated in raids associated with her son's case. So she goes in Capuchada uh, with the with the federal police um, to raid the um, the uh, drug treatment clinics um, run by the same person who disappeared um, her son. And actually all just anecdotally, all of the um, the three families that I interviewed all had participated in ways that at least to me were pretty unimaginable, kind of going on raids um, uh, with the Marines, um, participating really directly in the cases, things that I didn't know about these people. I'd known these people for, for 10 years. Before I did life history interviews, I didn't know to what extent they had actually been personally involved um, in operations, which I think is really kind of interesting. Um, so for all of these families, right? So I, we're, um, I'm not going to go through kind of what that looks like for, um, for for Lucia and for Juan Carlos, but for each of these families, what happens over time is that they develop what I call a common contentious repertoire, right? They all become con con they all begin to confront the state with contentious action. They go to marches. They uh, participate in hunger strikes. Um, they all partner with social movements. Um, specifically to access state officials. They all strategic, strategically, strategically navigate the state's judicial bureaucracy. All of them have multiple state officials um, on their WhatsApp um, and form individual relationships that help them get access to their case files um, and to kind of leverage different individual actions by different state officials. Um, they locate allies within the state and they participate in independent searches for their loved ones. So why does this matter, right? So, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll go on to that. So just kind of to sum this part up. So in the course of each individual struggle, their thinking evolves to have what I call a vision of, of what you, you and Sylvie say is a vision of legality as engagement and conflict resource and process, a constitutive part of the with the law perspective. So this daily contact with state officials, the omnipresence of legal contact in daily life makes reified understandings of legality impossible to sustain. That is, when you're involved in, um, in kind of in the in the after effects of this traumatic, the the this traumatic event, the disappearance of a loved one, 
all of these people were propelled into action and therefore they couldn't no, they could no longer sustain thinking that the whole state was against them or the whole state was kind of okay right all of them become uh, much more like juan carlos in the way that they think about the law um and again this changes this change in thinking begets actions which begets further changes in thinking right as each family shifts their vision of legality they're spurred to acquire knowledge and skills to strategically engage with state actors which in turn convinces them further of the law and legality as a contested and thoroughly human arena. So, um, and I'm looking at the time, I, I, I'll, I will cruise through this section a little bit. So kind of scaling up this consciousness, right? So if we think about the individuals who've been engaged in mobilization often um, um, for more than a decade, what does that look like in terms of when they act as a group, when the collective is making decisions, you have people who are more and more sophisticated. And what I argue is that as that sophistication grows, they're able to um, recognize different types of political and legal opportunities. And I specifically think about that along two, um, kind of in two ways. First, they're able to understand um, when they have state officials who are working cynically, that is for their own, for their own, um, um, for their own ends versus in solidarity with them, right? So as they find um, uh, officials who act in solidarity with them, that uh, that is a certain type of, of um, political opportunity. On the other side, they're able to understand when the state might be more open um, structurally to actually pursuing um, to pursuing justice in their cases. So when we have stints, my argument in brief is when we have cynical state officials and kind of stable alliances, by stable alliances, I mean um, the state officials are the same. So it's not an election year, they're not changing. And also the relationship of the state with the um, local criminal actors are also stable, right? So when you have elections or when you have a change in the control, the control of the plaza, um, that disrupts state alliances, right? So when we have unstable state alliances um, and we have cynical state state officials, and I'll I'll talk about when this is, we might have some kind of politically targeted prosecution, what I call what I call strategic prosecution. Um, when we have stable state alliances, and you might think nothing's possible, but you have some kind of good eggs, right? We have some good state officials. Um, I argue that we're probably not going to see any judicial progress in those cases, but we do have instances where kind of on the <laughs> on the down low, kind of secretly, you're going to have state officials um, working with victims in a low profile way to find remains and to have them identified, right? So we see that um, in Tamaulipas um, in a way that I find that's really surprising given what we would expect is possible there. Um, and finally, when we have willing state officials um, and we have unstable alliances, we actually might have, we have the biggest possibility for impunity erosion. Um, so again, I'm gonna kind of cruise through this. I, um, the, the states that I chose um, uh, to as, as brief case studies are Tamaulipas, Nuevo Leon, and Veracruz. Um, all of them, I chose um, periods in which all of them were um, uh, going from a pre-governor to a non-pre-governor in the next election. Um, and all of them were in areas where the setas um, were had perpetrated the majority, arguably the majority of the of the disappearances, um, and I argue that so from Veracruz to from 2016 to 18, um, we have under um, uh, the the Attorney General Winkler, we have some politically led um, uh, prosecutions. Um, in in Tamaulipas, we have really surprising collaborations between the state and the victims collectives, which lead to the localization of um, a fair number of, of of victims. And in Nuevo León, from 2011 to 2015, um, with the um, with the Attorney General and a um, very kind of capable um, local human rights NGO, Kazakh, um, we have kind of the greatest. It's the most. It's for me. It's the it's the case where we should see, and I argue that we do see the greatest advances in terms of in terms of justice um, and eroding impunity. So, um, just to kind of to end up um, with. So what do we see, right? What is the result of all of this, of all this struggle? 
um, really quick, I want to kind of push back on what we usually think of as impunity. So impunity, which we usually understand as just the state's failure to punish and a lack of um, individual criminal accountability. In Nancy's words, I think she, she helped me think through um, the fact that we shouldn't just think about impunity in those terms. She says, so in Nancy's case, um, I should say the, um, the person, the man who was in charge of the um, drug treatment clinic uh, was sentenced to prison for his involvement in uh, her son's disappearance. So she says, so I felt like the lawyers were saying to me, look, senora, look what we achieved. And I answered them, and, and my son, where's my son? It doesn't help me that this man is locked up. I have forgiven him. I'm looking for justice. I am looking for my son. So when I when I think about what it means to erode impunity, it's not, it's obviously justice is part of it, right? Formal, formal justice, but the UN 1997 um, a set of principles for combating impunity gives us kind of a more complete definition of what it means to erode impunity. It means the state must provide justice, but also reparations, the right to truth, and they must work towards preventing a recurrence of violations. So if we think about impunity or eroding impunity along these um, cuatro ejes, what do we actually, what do we actually see? So in terms of the right to truth, we see throughout the Mexican territory um, participatory investigations, mesas de trabajo. Um, I know this is a terrible picture, but I got it from, I couldn't, I've been in lots of these mesas de trabajo, none of which I could take um, pictures at. So this I got through an information request. Um, so in most of, I'd say in, in most Mexican territories, most of the states where we have um, uh, victims collectives, which again is about is about at least um, in half of the states, the way that justice currently happens is these informal participatory investigations where you have everybody involved in the case. So that's going to be the the local MEP, the um, the representatives of the Comisiones de Búsqueda, the of the Comisión de Derechos Humanos, and often the federal their federal counterparts, federal counterparts, as well as um, there might be some low level police people there, um, represented from the NGO and the victim's family, right? So the kind of norm is that every month or so, um, all of those people sit around a table, right? It, like in this in this bad picture, <laughs> um, and they make acuerdos, right? They make, um, they make a plan for, okay, so last month you said that you would check the morgues um, and the hospitals to see if anybody unidentified had come in. Um, did you do that? And if not, why? And what can we do to make sure that happens? Um, Mother of the victim, you said that you would be in touch with the with um, the victim's cousin who had talked to them two days beforehand. Have you done that? What have you heard from them? Are they willing to talk to us? So it's a coordination of, of the investigation, which already is an advancement of the right to truth. What we know is, I mean, what I think I know, but it's it's anecdotal because of the nature of, of the way evidence is compiled, is that in uh, most case files, unless something like this happens, unless you have mesas de trabajo after three years after reporting the disappearance, if you open the case file, it will be empty, right, other than the report of the disappearance. So having these mesas de trabajo, um, there's lots of problems with them. Um, they don't, um, I think the promise of them is less than we had hoped, but they do represent, if we think about the right to the truth as a continuum, rather as black and white, you either know or you don't know, I think these undoubtedly at least get us further um, uh, in terms of in terms of that. Um, so again, these are just kind of different. I have um, kind of different examples of the right to truth. In terms of the right to justice, um, I think it's really difficult, again, uh, to say, but I think anecdotally, um, what I saw is that with the with the victims in the Moyen Por La Paz, as well as in the collectives, we do have some small victories, right? So in, specifically in the cases I talk about, um, uh, in the book for Lucina Alfonso, there's seven people detained for privación ilegal de la libertad. For Juan Carlos and Doña Marti, there's very little actually. And for Nancy, um, the perpetrator actually did go to prison. I did a case study with Kadak um, in in um, um, in Monterrey. Um, and worked with them on, on putting it together a database. So I believe these numbers more than I believe any other numbers in this presentation um, because I've reviewed the case files and worked closely with Kadak. So I think in terms of best case, um, so Kadak uh, uh, documented 269 disappearances between 2009 and 2012. In 2019, when I updated these um, stats, there were 37 indictments or convictions in those cases. A lot of municipal police municipal police had been indicted or convicted, no federal agents. Um, and while they had been um, 
uh, convicted or indicted, almost none of them were for enforced disappearance, right? All of them were for other crimes. So um, more than anything else, privación ilegal de la libertad. Um, so kind of overall, the picture for these for these cases is that out of 269 people, 213 are still missing. 21 people were found alive in the same year, two in a different year, and 27 people were identified through DNA. And just kind of to stop for a second, I think these results are both um, horrifically insufficient and for those people, right? For these um, kind of more than about 50 people who were, um, who were found and identified those in those cases, the work of Kadak together with the with the Procuraduría um, changed those families' lives forever. So I think this is both kind of deeply um, kind of a reason for despair and also um, a reason for hope. So I think these are this is really double edged. But I think to me this is represents a snapshot of what the best case is in terms of in terms of justice um, and rewarding impunity. So in terms of right to reparation, we know that the, we have the victim's law and the law and the general law on forced disappearance. I won't go over those. Um, I bet most of you are familiar with them. Um, but I want to close with, because I want to leave time for, for Q&A, um, what I think is actually the most surprising and, and in some ways the most important um, tool against impunity um, that I found in my research. So this is... Um, uh, the next two slides are quotes from um, Jolci, who is a um, a young woman whose sister was disappeared, and she happened upon um, a social uh, a colectivo that's led actually by Juan Carlos Trujillo, one of the one of the people in the book, in 2019. And here she talks about what it meant for her to actually start to participate in in um, with this um, with this group. She says, "I came up to them like a hungry child." Um, them meaning Juan Carlos and, and his collective. And it was the first time I said, I have a disappeared sister. For me, it was like flipping a switch. Before I joined this group, I felt that I had died. Now I feel like I'm surviving, but we need to feel like we're living. And that's what I feel like they're teaching me to do. They tell me we aren't alone. There are things you can do. My sister's not a case file number. My sister's not a forgotten photo. My sister isn't a person that we shouldn't think about. They taught me to say, my sister has a name. She is Jatsin. She's a mother. And I learned to talk about her in the present tense, not in the past. And as long as I look for her, she is present. They, Juan Carlos and the other members of the victims collectives might think they did nothing, but they gave me our lives. They made us revive as a family. My mother began to live again. The fact that we have a photo of my sister on the wall of our house now, that is a huge achievement. It was a secret in our house. For them, maybe it is nothing. And the family's asking me the same thing. How can I express my thanks? And I say, you don't have to thank me. You don't have to pay me. Help someone else who's going through what, you, what you're what you going through. Teach them about what you have learned. And this is the way to pay it forward. Our goal is to bring the same hope that they are bringing to us. So I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you all so much. Um, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Janice. Um for your fascinating work and uh, and presentation. We'll, we'll move to um, the Q&A now. And as you know, if you're interested in asking a question, please raise your hand on the um, Zoom app and I will call on you. Um, um, let's see, Benjamin Montaigne, you, you uh, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Professor, for this talk. Um, it's it's difficult to to hear, but uh, it's important, and I recognize that. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about throughout your talk is, um, well, I couldn't help but think of the very many collectives of searchers who become much more visible as they engage with these processes, and I'm wondering how that sort of fits into the matrix of your argument, given the fact that people searching for their loved ones become much more vulnerable to different kinds of threats. And I wonder if, if you've talked to some of these people, especially in, in autonomous movements, and how that sort of, how their political or legal consciousness is affected when they become even more vulnerable by, by virtue of participating. So thank you. Go ahead, you can answer. Yeah. Okay. 
Ben, I mean, thank you so much for, for your question. I should say, if anybody wants to ask questions in Spanish, please go ahead. Um, so I should say, most of my field work was conducted between 2011 and 2014, right? I went back kind of several times per year after that. Um, so my focus, so the, so the Busqueda like really appears in 2015. A lot of the book is actually about Juan Carlos's thought about, about Busqueda, about what it means to actually search kind of in the land um, for for um, your loved ones. And I think in many ways, that's the logical extension, right? So Juan Carlos starts out as with the law. He thinks about the game. He thinks about legality as a game and where it brings him is that his energy is better spent working autonomously, right? I mean, I think that's, that's the kind of the logical conclusion is that the meses de trabajo in the end aren't rendiendo cuentas like he 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 continues in them he continues to go to the mesa de trabajo but he essentially delegates that work to to his lawyers right probably takes on his case um and he begins so he starts to lead um the right the asociación de the familiares en busca maria herrera right so he becomes one of the leaders in the in the buscando in the in the kind of the searching for the land um I think another really interesting thing is that when his, so right, he has two brothers, two sets of brothers are disappeared, one in 2008, one in 2010. So the 2008, this is before kind of the bigger movements have, have formed. Um, and I, I promise I'm coming back to your, coming back to your, to your question, but um, in the first disappearances, he kind of rings all the bells of politicians and kind of gets to the president and, and kind of goes all the way up the political ladder. In the second disappearances, he doesn't because it doesn't work, right? So he goes right, he goes to Veracruz, he goes to the plaza where in the, in the, in the small town where they were in Costa Rica in, in, in Veracruz where they were disappeared and tries and like goes undercover and talks to the to the jefe de la plaza because he's like that's the only thing that makes a difference right so I think in, if kind of the logical the progression of the argument is that um given the lack of I mean I think it's very contextual right so I think the logical ends is that the victim must become more and more capable of um, discerning what the like who the political players are, and in so many places where we have a state that is either entirely or largely or kind of on, on the spectrum of not being able to respond, it leads to taking action not um, not sanctioned by the state. I think, um, and that, as you say, makes them more vulnerable in many ways. I do want to say I think the 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 busquedas prevent present really different security situations depending on whether um, the local officials are accompanying them, right? Or are they or are they actively condemning them? And I think one really interesting thing that shows the kind of lack of ideological, these are not ideologically driven movements. They're deeply, again, they're they're with the law. They're deeply practical and strategic, right? So these are not movements. The the busque, the buscando movements, and I we got um, I'm sorry, Ben I mean if you disagree, I'd love to hear. Like I think I don't know of any of the, the buscadores who don't seek to be um, accompanied and legitimated by um, at least some state officials. Maybe they're federal agents and they might reject local accompaniment if they feel that there is specific um, implications against, uh, against local officials. But most of them, for security reasons as well as for legal reasons, are actually not against the state, right? They're not turning against the state. They're still looking for those allies within the state. So. Um, if they are in places where they can't get accompaniment from anybody within the state and where they're where they're being specifically um uh threatened then then that's obviously kind of in terms of security is the most difficult situation but most times in terms of my understanding the the big kind of um Plantones, they buscadores won't go to those places because the security situation is too hard right so the i'm thinking about the um some of the the mass graves in Tamaulipas, where the 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 colectivos began to go, and then they were getting threatened, so they had to stop. Right. So I think um, anyway. So that's a long answer. I don't know if it exactly responds to it, but um, those are some of my my thoughts about it. And I'm I'm going back now, and I'm I'm literally tomorrow, right? So I'm and I'm looking forward to to kind of catching up um, with a lot of the colectivos that I know that since we have last talked have really. Um, concentrate on buscando more than they ever did before. So I'll stop there. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan Sesh. Hi, good afternoon. 
Janice, nice to see you. Um, I want to go up to about 30,000 feet. And look, you did a fabulous job of presenting three really interesting cases and the conclusions you draw from them um, about the empowerment people feel when they have achieved something and at least they're asking for something corresponds to studies that, you know, it's sort of, it's not just Mexico, right? You're doing a good job of of generalizing it. Um, but the 30,000 feet level is Mexico's going into a presidential election year or is in a presidential election year. And I know from um, human rights lawyers I've been in contact with, of course, everyone is disappointed in the, prom the gap between promises and achievements in AMLO's um, sexenio. And one of the questions, particularly I think with Ayotzinapa and the 43 disappeared has to go do with the involvement of the army in that and not wanting to overturn that. But maybe even just leaving that case aside, how do you see um, an election year creating a context that either is gonna be helpful or not? And do you have any hints, let's assume that Claudio, Schein Claudio Scheinbaum is gonna get elected about how this issue may look different in the national context in the next sexenio, or maybe it's the same. Thank you. It's a really good question. I um, I think again, I backed away. The reason this isn't, so I thought this was gonna be a book about um, about the kind of changes post Ayotzinapa. Before that, I thought it was gonna be a book about how, I hoped that my dissertation, which I finished in 2015, was gonna be about how the changing of positioning of international law had kind of had, and the, um, and the kind of some of the decisions of the Inter-American Court would have kind of trickled down and changed the way that the way that justice happens. Um, I hoped that the, I mean, hoped against hope, um, that we would have seen in the last six years really much more significant, like many of us, right? That, that we would have seen kind of more significant revisions. But I think it was pretty clear from um, from the campaign on, if you were looking kind of closely, that, that um, AMLO didn't have any real ideas about how to change the fundamental incentives, right? Of kind of what, of, of the provision of justice um, and, much less so not so to right if we if we separate the issues of addressing past disappearances and preventing future ones neither one um i didn't i didn't hear any any new ideas and it wasn't surprising and kind of in that context that we didn't see more i think um what we have seen is the state does not criminalize uh, victims in the same way that um, we saw under Peña Nieto Caderón, right? We don't have the predominant, the predominant discourse is no longer es que estaban en algo, right? There's kind of that, and I think that does matter, right? I think in terms of um, biasing the kind of encouraging and deepening the biasing of the entire um, security system, the security state and the justice system against the victims, um, it helps to have that, okay, the most hopeful thing I can say is it helps to have, uh, to not have that discourse. Course, right, and I think that that's that's something, and I hope that we continue to see that. Susan, do you want to? Well, that's fine. That's a good response. Okay. I thought you were saying. I thought you were. I thought no, no, I was saying it's a small step. Right. Yes. They're making I it. Really small I thought you were saying a small point. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, these are all small steps, and I, I wish there was. I mean, I mean, I think what it would actually take, and I just don't think we have. I haven't heard anything from from either candidate. Um, we need somebody who understands the that we need to change the to me that we need to change the incentive of the ministerios públicos. We need we need to change the incentives of um, of the case coordinators um, to actually um, reward. Kind of to me, Adrián de la Garza was the was the was the attorney general in in uh, Monterrey um, when I was working there, and the kind of the he was rewarding investigators who advanced cases and that is not happening in almost anywhere right so we need somebody kind of from kind of from 30,000 feet who's thinking about what would it look like to actually incentivize accountability um and progress in these cases i think um Carla Quintana has amazing ideas and doesn't have the budget nor the um nor hasn't been given the authority to do the type of work that she needs to that i think she know she i've heard her talk um that she knows needs to be done um so I, I, I'm avoiding the question because I'm, I'm hopefully I'll, I'll think about this differently two months, three months from now when I've kind of been on the ground again. Um, but I don't see anybody talking about the kind of structural changes that would be needed um, to, to fundamentally alter a militarized approach 
um, uh, to security, which we would need to for prevention. I mean, that's to say it to say a huge thing in, in a very short amount of time. And in terms of addressing the um, addressing past disappearances, I also don't think we were nobody's thinking about kind of fundamentally how do we change a justice system that's broken. So um, yeah. which is why I talk about. I think the old to me where I see the hope is um, is. That's, I, I hope I'm not just telling nice stories, right? That, that give us some hope. I hope for me, I'm pointing to that because I think we need to follow, we have to start micro. This has to be bottom up change because it's not, there's there we have the beautiful laws, right? We have um, kind of everything on the books institutionally that we could hope for. And it's not changing things because we don't have anybody taking seriously the political will necessary to actually make there be real consequences for impunity. Thank you. I have to go now because I have office hours. So Thank nice you. To, Great to see you. Thank you. Um, Aida Palma, you're next. Hello, Professor Gallagher. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say wonderful study. And I, to the last conversation that we were having, I think that, that I appreciate your focus on building individual leadership. I think from an organizing perspective um, and thinking about long-term social and systemic change, seeing how people's individual leadership and political awakening happen through this process, you know, and people have catalysts for activism in many different ways. Um, but I think for me, the hope and the long-term vision that I, I hope your work continues to elevate is that um, communities transform and investing in the leadership development of people who have been excluded from meritocracy and from structural politics uh, builds a new type of grassroots leadership that can transform social culture. And so, yes, it's about responding to victims of violence now, but it's also about thinking ahead about how we build a stronger community collectivism in Mexico um, and leaders that can lead from the grassroots. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I don't know if you have more to say about like, even beyond people's own engagement with their searches, how they continue to engage in activism and community building um, back home. I it's wonderful to see you. I was my student many years ago, like almost a decade ago at Brown. It's wonderful to see you and that's a um, great question. So um, yeah, and I, and I, I, and I think you're totally right. I mean, I think the the colectivos have become really sophisticated in understanding their own needs and asking for apoyo psicosocial, asking for um, the kind of legal courses um, and the psychological courses that they need to that they need to that they need to sustain this work. I think, as we might expect, kind of the the psychological toll of being present um, with their trauma day to day takes an incredible toll. Um, I think one of the hardest things, and I and I don't talk about it in the book, um, is the stakes of strategic decisions seem incredibly high. I mean, they are uh, are perceived as incredibly high for people who are organizing for the return of their loved ones, which means, to me, disagreements that might um, otherwise be kind of overcomable have led to um, kind of the continuing fracturing of the victims' movement, which we've seen kind of in every country where we have... Um, um, victims movements where we have disappearances. So to me, I think understanding that that's a natural part of this and that that's actually in some ways productive, that there's kind of complementary, that the that the dynamics that that um, generates can be productive is um, is is a really important thing. So I I, I think um, yeah, I would I, I I agree that a lot of what what I hope the book does is focus us on the needs and the leadership of these local colectivos de victimas because they are kind of burrowing into the state and actually making impunity. So dedicating resources and thought into how to support them, how to support their leadership and development is exactly where I think we, where I hope, um, that's where I hope our, our energy goes um, after after reading this and also and just and um, kind of philosophically um, and strategically. Um, that's where I think we need to where we need to be. Thank you. Um, so we have two more questions and we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask you both first, Antonio Gutierrez and then Patricia Samudio to ask your questions. And then Janice, you'll have the last word. Uh, in answering their questions. Please go ahead. And thank you, Janice. Uh, th thank you for the excellent presentation and the research work that you have done. Very simple question, and I hope a very, very simple answer. Uh, you are very knowledgeable of the situation of 
these people. If someone comes and asks you for help, advice, what to do to deal with the disappearance of a relative or family, what would you do? What would be your answer? Simple. Thank you. You're saying, give up, forget about it, no. don't waste your time. What, what would be the answer? Eh, hola, Janis, soy eh, Patricia, estoy en Veracruz. Y yo tengo una, una pregunta que de algún modo ya sugeriste esto de que nuestras energías se vayan a fomentar la organización, el fortalecimiento de los colectivos. Yo tengo experiencia desde el Consejo Ciudadano del, de, en materia de búsqueda del Estado y tengo experiencia como terapeuta de familiares, de personas desaparecidas. Y algo que estoy notando, bueno, que noté desde que llegué, es justamente esta falta de asociacionismo entre ellos, pero además la falta de eh, otro tipo de organizaciones eh, de derechos humanos o, eh, que respalden ese trabajo. Porque las personas están muy ocupadas tratando de encontrar a sus familiares, algunas también quieren justicia y le dedican tiempo, pero eh, 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 bueno, la gran mayoría que yo he conocido no. Y no tenemos ese respaldo, está en el Instituto Mexicano de Derechos Humanos y Democracia, está Serapaz y alguno otro por ahí pero no alcanzan pues, a acompañar y a, y a construir colectivamente una agenda, una agenda política que justo como dices, estratégicamente vaya eh, eh, presentando ante el gobierno eh, y ante otros eh, elementos, eh, miembros de la sociedad eh, eh, o ideas para cambiar y propuestas para cambiar colectivamente. Entonces, ¿qué sugieres, pues? O sea, te presento el problema y ahora... En dos quieres? minutos, pues, vamos, vamos. Um... First, I, so first, what to do. Um, so these, these are calls, which I get. Um, and I think for me, the, the, the responses to canalizarlos to the, to the local colectivos de víctimas. So there is, in terms of what cual tipo de asociación hay, there is, um, so I know people or, or, or um, the people I know know people who have contact with the, with the local colectivos. The form of searching for people is really different depending on the contexto de la plaza, the contexto político del, del específico del estado. And so what I would do um, uh, um, in response is put that person in contact with the local, with the folks locally who are involved in responding um, to the to that context, right? So putting them in putting them in context. So often what happens is, right? These are, disappearances happen in a spate in a pattern. Um, so putting them in contact with the with the local colectivo, so that they say, okay, this happened to somebody else a month ago, and these are the formas de incidentes que usamos en, en este en este caso. Algo sí funcionó, algo no. Por ejemplo, tenemos contacto con el gobernador, entonces como abrimos línea con él. También tenemos como policía de confianza local, entonces también te hacemos este, con, este contacto. Entonces, como utilizar la red nacional para ubicar dónde pasó, con quién debe estar en contacto y pasar los datos allí. Y de allí también estar difundiendo. Like, so just doing kind of immediately one of the good things about Facebook that the colectivos have, have done is immediately launching um, Facebook pages and trying to get the image out there as much as possible. So, and I know we're out of time. <laughs> Solo diría, bueno, en en, respondo a, a Patricia, muchas gracias por la pregunta y por el trabajo que haces. Diría que no es suficiente, pero sí se ha cambiado a nivel nacional lo que están haciendo los, los, las organizaciones de, de derechos humanos. Por ejemplo, el Centro por DH antes jamás hubiera tomado los casos de desapariciones porque no son violaciones tradicionales de derechos humanos, porque quién sabe quién es el perpetrador. Tal vez está implicado el Estado, tal vez no, y probablemente es un lodo de, de qué criminal es Estado, ¿no? Entonces, por eso se han demorado responder, pero sí lo están haciendo, sí lo han cambiado, pero yo diría que el, como la magnitud del problema no, como el lo que había de derechos humanos simplemente no alcanzaba, no alcanza el, el, como la magnitud del problema. Por eso tenemos esos colectivos locales. Y como para mí también este enfoque en el individual con el colectivo también tiene que ver con el, la, la my observación que um, muchos es, eh, ha sido difícil construir cole, um, luchas comunales porque es porque son violaciones a cada persona y le importa mucho 
como hacer lo correcto para su persona, para su hijo, para su ser amado. Entonces, hacerlo colectivo ha sido complicado. Entonces, por eso tenemos este a nivel individual y colectivo. Es, es difícil. Entonces, perdón, Patricia, no es suficiente, pero un poquito así y me encantaría seguir hablando. Te voy a buscar, te voy a buscar luego. Okay, perfecto, perfecto, Patricia. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Janice. I mean, this is a very important topic. Clearly, we could go on for much longer, but unfortunately, as you said, we are out of time. Um, so all that remains is to thank Janice Gallagher on behalf of all of us for her work and for her presentation, both courageous and insightful. Um, we look forward to hearing more about this and uh, um, as your work uh, progresses. Thank you everyone for join us, joining us and uh, I hope to see you again next week. Thank Buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias. Adiós.